story is entitled, By the Light of the Firefly, written by Luke 13, and read by David Cummings. When I was a boy, I lived with my mother in an old house in Georgia. It was small, and most parts of it were fairly worn, but the asking price was cheap, and we needed a home. It wasn't all bad, though. The place had a pretty large backyard and acres of woodland behind it. On one particularly hot summer day, I was sitting inside playing with my dog Marley as my mother was leaving for work and discussing the usual guidelines with the babysitter. I'll be back around 11, I remember her saying. Make sure he's in bed by 10. The babysitter nodded and smiled as my mother called goodbye to me and shut the door. Now it was just me, Marley, and the babysitter from down the street. I'm going to run a couple of errands, said the babysitter, to which I nodded without looking up. I suppose here is where I mentioned this babysitter was an asshole. After my mother would leave for work, she would politely excuse herself from the house, returning just in time to collect her pay. I never complained, however. I wasn't ever afraid of being alone, and what kid doesn't like having no rules for a while? I spent most of the day playing Game Boy or chasing Marley around the house. When the sun fell, it came time for my favorite summer activity, catching fireflies. I couldn't tell you why, but I was just so fascinated by fireflies and liked to keep them as pets. I grabbed an old mason jar from under the sink and left through the squeaky screen door to the back porch, Marley following at my heels. I was greeted by the overwhelming sound of insects buzzing all around the backyard. I walked down the wooden steps of the deck and began my search for fireflies. I looked for the faint glowing lights for what felt like hours, shuffling through the grass and the warm night air. Suddenly I saw it, the biggest firefly I had ever seen, blinking around the old rusted chain link fence in the very back. With jar in hand I whipped after it. Marley barking after me. I had soon made it to the fence when the firefly began to retreat into the woods. I wasn't about to go back empty-handed, so I climbed over the fence with a bit of a struggle and into the woods. Marley whined on the other side as I walked past old, mossy trunks, leaves crunching under my feet as I went, following the glowing yellow light. The woods felt like I had stepped into another world. The trees were enormously tall, and the leaves atop shrouded any moonlight from entering. Just as I was beginning to feel I had gone too far, I looked back to find the shining porch lights of my house, but I could not see any trace of them. I had been engulfed by the woods. I couldn't hear the buzzing of insects anymore. It was silent now. I looked forward again to find the firefly drawing closer. I needed to catch it now, if only to use it as a light to find my way back. I swooped at it with my jar and caught air. Startled, the firefly began to float upwards, blinking its yellow light as it went. It kept going higher and higher out of my reach, and I followed it with my eyes. It drifted up the high timbers, and suddenly I saw... I saw everything. Bodies. Hundreds of twisted bodies. Men and women, boys and girls, strung up like puppets in the branches, illuminated only by the light of the firefly. I couldn't move, paralyzed by fear. I could hear everything, the creaking of the ropes, the moaning of the old trees, and the footsteps close by. I ducked behind a tree, trying to quiet my harsh gasping. I had gone too far, I thought, and now I was going to live up there as another puppet. I didn't know what to do, whether to run or wait, but the footsteps were growing closer. It knows I'm here, I thought. There was no way it couldn't have heard me coming. Mustering all my courage, I shoved off from the tree and bolted towards the direction I came, whipping up leaves as I went. I could hear it giving chase behind me, its feet pounding the earth rhythmically as it went. I ran faster than I ever had in my life. I couldn't stop the tears from streaming as the wind slapped against my face. I hadn't even said goodbye to my mother when she left. As I had hoped, the lights of the back porch were shining through the dark ahead of me. I could hear Marley barking and I knew I would soon meet the old rusty fence. 
I remember thinking that climbing the fence would slow me down, but it was the only way. The trembling earth was growing closer, and the tip of my shoe caught a root and I slipped, landing on my stomach. I fumbled over onto my back and began kicking away from the faint outline getting closer. I gripped my mason jar and threw it as hard as I could into the black wood. I heard a thud and got to my feet. I met the fence and vaulted into my backyard. I screamed for my dog and we both dashed up the deck and inside, locking the door as we rushed through. I sprinted upstairs to my room and took Marley with me, locking the door and pushing a chair against it. I collapsed onto my bed with the lights on, my mind racing. I checked the clock. 10.33. Relief washed over me. I was safe now, and soon Mom would be home. Perhaps it was the adrenaline leaving my body, because I suddenly grew very tired. I didn't want to sleep, but I couldn't fight it. I passed out on my bed with the lights on and Marley by my side. I awoke suddenly in the night to a pitch black room. The covers were over me so I had guessed mom had gotten back and checked in on me. I was sweating under the warm comforter and turned on my other side. That was when I saw it. A face, inches away from my own, with bone white skin stretched tightly over its skull. Its tall, thin figure was hunched and bent over my bed. Its lidless eyes watched me, studying me. I wanted to recoil at the sight of it, but I couldn't move. Suddenly, everything changed. I woke up gasping. The lights were on in my room and the chair was still pushed against the door. Marley lifted his head and looked at me. My eyes drifted to the clock. 10.46 I heard the doorbell ring and I ran downstairs to the front door, wrenching it open and falling into my mother's arms, crying. And so here I sit, ten years later to the day, in a lobby crowded with people because I can't stand to be alone. I remember my mother traveling into the woods the next day against my wishes, only returning to say she hadn't seen anything. My brain had played tricks on me in the dead of night, she said. I didn't believe it at the time, and I don't now. There isn't a night that goes by that I don't think about it. That one night I'll wake up to see that horrible face again, and this time it won't be a dream. What scares me most is the thought that on that warm summer night ten years ago, I was the one that got away. The pet it didn't get to keep.